Since my mom was the music director of my family's church growing up, early Sunday mornings were a reality for me long before I became a minister. But there was one Sunday morning each year that jolted my family awake, especially early. On the second weekend of June, thousands of motorcycles and other vehicles came roaring into my hometown of Akron, Ohio. Many poured down our short, steep street, which ends at the Mount Peace Cemetery. There, Dr. Bob, co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, is buried. While it took some years to fully appreciate the significance of this annual Founders' Day pilgrimage, where thousands come to honor a man whose healing steps saved and continue to save their lives, I remember my parents telling us to celebrate and be grateful for the noises of that morning. Here were people who'd faced their own version of rock bottom, admitted their own powerlessness, and found new life on the other side. It is not unlike Mary and later others who early on a Sunday morning some 2,000 years ago go to the graveyard where Jesus is buried powerless to stop all that unfolded in the days prior. They bravely go to prepare the body of their beloved for its final rest. There instead, of course, they meet an unsealed tomb, empty, save for some old grave clothes and a previously unimagined possibility of new life. Richard Rohr says that Jesus' death and resurrection reveal a universal pattern, a rhythm of loss and renewal built into the fabric of life itself. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, for instance, winter has given way to spring, though this weekend didn't feel too much like spring, but new life literally springing forth from all that died in winter. Those joining online in our Southern Hemisphere are living into the loss of fall and winter, perhaps already anticipating the renewal of spring again. Since this sermon began some three minutes ago, some 900 million cells in each of our bodies have died and been replaced with new ones. Or think about when someone dies rescuing another from trouble or standing up to injustice. We say that their death, though tragic, is inspiring. What does inspire mean? It means to breathe in life, to give life. Death, paradoxically, becomes the engine for new life, loss, the ground for renewal. The same is true of the spiritual journey into wholeness. It invites surrender, an historically loaded Christian word we might reclaim and reimagine. One that doesn't mean a passive or resigned giving up, but rather an active, intentional giving to. Mike, the leader of the Narcotics Anonymous groups in my former church in Pennsylvania, used to say that when he was in active addiction, he gave up everything for one thing, his substance of choice at the time. But when he got sober, now going on an amazing 16 years, he gave up that one thing so he could give his life to everything else. The wisdom of the 12 steps begins in powerlessness. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Our powerless may be more visible, like those addicted to substances. Others of us disguise ours well, overcompensate for our more hidden addictions and attachments, even to our way of thinking. We take our own patterns as normative, logical, surely true, even when they do not compute. So we may keep doing the same thing repeatedly, even if it isn't working. This is the self-destructive nature of all addictions. And it is why the first step of the 12 is often experienced as the hardest, most denied, and most avoided. No one likes to lose who they think they are. 
Our egos, hate, change the most, even when the present situation is horrible and unsustainable. We'd rather be ruined than change, the saying goes. So we do more and more of what doesn't work. And yet, mature spirituality is about letting go and unlearning. It is about surrendering, and in our surrendering, new life is to be found. Faith is deepened. An alternative consciousness or way of being becomes discernible, which may lead to the experience of and union with all that we've truly desired in this life and tried to find outside of ourselves. Peace, contentment, joy, belonging, love, a higher power as we understood it. Yet we discover these were here available all along in the very reality we were addicted to escaping or numbing. We decide not to push to the front of the line, and something much better happens in the back of the line. We learn to let go of our anger, and we find that we start feeling much happier. We surrender our need to control our partner, and finally the relationship blossoms. We recognize and admit some of the fault lay within us, and we discover the same tired patterns we keep running up against suddenly change. Or we heal harmful theologies that render the divine cold, distant, judgmental, and uncaring, and become aware of an intimate presence with and within us, a presence that is for our healing and wholeness the very ground of love itself, love that was never meant to be earned or achieved, but realized and embraced. Yet each of these instances is a choice, and each time a kind of dying. For Saul, angered by those in his own tradition who were insisting that Jesus was the Messiah and had been raised from the dead, he goes about voraciously holding them to account, dragging them before the courts, punishing them severely, even presiding over one of their executions. Saul was a religious man, convinced he was doing what was good and right. When on the road to Damascus, he encounters his own rock bottom, a brilliant light out of which speaks the voice of the risen Jesus. Saul is unable to see for three days, not for punishment, but to reveal symbolically how deep his resistance was to realizing how much harm his actions were causing. I've known very few people who've described having a similar experience to Saul, their own come to Jesus moment, if you will. But for most, it is a more gradual process toward rock bottom. Sometimes we are as addicted to our justifications for why we're right, why what we're doing is harmless, as anything else. Powerlessness tills the ground for radical honesty, especially about difficult truths we'd rather not admit. Yet as Padre Gotuma writes, the deepest impulse of healthy religion and spirituality is to move from the realm of obligation to something entirely more intuitive, the telling of truth, the doing of truth, so that we can experience the true living of a life. I believe this is what happens to Saul on that road. And while in his letters he never calls that moment a conversion, he says it was a transformation, a, a radical reorientation of life. So profound was his becoming that he takes a new name, Paul. When the risen Jesus begins appearing to other people on Easter, he is almost unrecognizable. So Jesus reveals the scars of crucifixion, the wounds endured at his moments of total powerlessness. Perhaps to say that as we live into our own resurrections and tend our profoundest wounds, they remain a part of us, 
although they no longer define us. What once were intended for harm and shame can become surprising sources of strength. Sometimes we learn and venture to share them vulnerably and bravely with others. And they become an inspiration. They breathe new life into the atmosphere, breathe loving encouragement for others to begin or continue healing their own. Many in recovery communities have shared with me that they experience their meeting rooms as sacred spaces, sanctuaries as holy as this magnificent room where their full selves are not only welcomed but required for the journey into wholeness. Hi, I'm, and I'm an addict. Hi, the community responds with the person's name. When we are at the end of ourselves, we begin to believe we are only what we struggle with. We baptize ourselves with names that are far from the only truth about us. Our dependencies separate us from the goodness of our true selves and from the goodness of others in the world and this life. You may remember that tragic but endearing figure Gollum in The Lord of the Rings. He reveals the sad reality of being divided, being separated from ourselves. They cursed us and drove us away. And we wept, precious, we wept to be so alone. And we only wished to catch fish so juicy sweet. And we forgot the taste of bread, the sound of trees, the softness of the wind. We even forgot our own name. How powerful it must be to step into these rooms and hear our true name spoken. We are all more than our struggles, our afflictions, and far more than any guilt and shame. We are God's beloved in unchangeable, irrevocable truth, I happen to believe with my whole heart. Powerlessness is a gift because in our most tender and vulnerable, we discover we are not alone. The spirit is present and always was, and the community becomes a tangible reminder each time they exhale our name. Wrote Joseph Campbell, where you stumble, there lies your treasure. The very cave you are afraid to enter turns out to be the source of what you are looking for. The damned thing in the cave that was so dreaded has become the center. Some of us are in that tomb today, but new life has yet to come. Others are nearing that place. Still others are not ready. Others know powerlessness because we're going through a loss of some kind. And others among us are accompanying those in recovery. Our own powerlessness we feel acutely each day, like Vincent van Gogh's brother Theo did throughout their lives together. That's him on the front of our programs today. And it was known that his steady love and emotional support amid his brother's many struggles allowed Vincent to have a career as an artist, which gave us a starry night like no other and a cafe terrace in which we imagined ourselves feasting. Others in Al-Anon and Naranon learned that sometimes truly loving someone means allowing them to make their own decisions and putting boundaries around our contact. Yet in all these valleys of the shadow of death, there is hope. Indeed, a shadow can only exist because of the presence of light. Early followers of Jesus used to sing in the sacred dark before the dawn of their Easter vigils. Even at the grave, we make our song, Alleluia. Alleluia. 
their faith reminding them that endings often give way to new beginnings once unimaginable. The 12 steps also witness to this beautiful truth and what possibilities for new life these hold for all of us, for our community in this season of Eastertide. Just before the prayer time, you might have heard loud applause coming from downstairs. Members of Crystal Meth Anonymous LA are announcing to their group their sober anniversaries. Some are celebrating 25 years or more, others two hours or less. Their sharing is liturgy. And later this week, the hall will be empty, save for some old grave clothes. So I'll watch where I walk. I once asked Mike what I could share with my board when presenting the proposal that we welcome more Narcotics Anonymous meetings into our church. He said, tell them people recover. They just need a chance and some folding chairs. People recover. People find wholeness in community where they belong without question, where their true names are spoken and known, and where they are loved and love in return. Good friendship is half the spiritual journey, isn't it? Ananda once asked the Buddha, and the Buddha replied, it's the whole thing. Shall we brave it together, my friends? Amen.